Yeah, training can give us better energy. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's the five o'clock block on a Thursday. And we have our old friend, Guillermo Sabatier. He joins us from Florida. Hi, Guillermo. Hi, Jay, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, training. Let's talk about uh, electrical infrastructure, grids and the like, and particularly in the shadow of what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, uh, where uh, our friend uh, uh, Putin has, um, you know, he's unleashed a, a huge, uh, may I say, blitzkrieg into uh, uh, eastern Ukraine and killing people now. Um, but uh, in exchange of uh, messages today with uh, Joe Biden, he uh, essentially threatened nuclear war. He said, he said, don't mess with me. I'm a powerful and nuclear country. Mm-hmm. That's not comforting. Um, but at the same time, you know, before he gets to nuclear, he does a lot of cyber attacks. He knows how to do it. He's got, you know, he's got his whole Internet Research Agency over there, which have been, uh, you know, spreading misinformation during elections and otherwise. And they are responsible for a lot of the misinformation that's on social media and in the election rhetoric. So it's very troublesome. And he will do that. Furthermore, I want to add, Guillermo, before we get started on this, that there was a, a story on 60 Minutes on Sunday about electric, electric, uh, electronic microwaves. It's the Havana syndrome. Mm-hmm. And uh, up till now, we weren't sure that it was actually happening to American officials, State Department, Foreign Service and the like. But now it seems clear with the number of cases, reports and examination uh, by medical as well as uh, Foreign Service personnel and their families that um, our people have been attacked with microwaves. And uh, that's just another way you can cross borders. It's another way you can do, um, you know, under the hood type attacks on American personnel, American institutions. So that means that our utilities should be concerned because they are, I don't want to say vulnerable, but, but they're, position in the economy, their position in the way our society works is so important. And without them, we are in terrible shape. So we have to be very careful. We have to develop sustainability and resilience to deal with all manner of things, especially including uh, aggressive cyber attacks. Um, So I assume you agree, but tell me your thoughts about that. Well, it's... um... Reflecting on what happened the years back when the Ukraine, when they had those two uh, cyber attacks, right? Th- those were those were deeply studied, right, uh, by by our industry here and by Idaho National Labs, right? And and the Ukraine at some point even asked for our help to go over there and be able to do a forensics to understand what happened to them, and 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 and. They were doing a lot of the things that we stopped doing more than a decade ago, and and a lot of that is as a result of the uh, NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Corporations. It's that regulating body in our industry, and in there uh, they have a lot of standards, but some of them specifically address uh, SIP, uh, critical infrastructure protection, and in there it has to do with cybersecurity. So uh, th- there is a very resilient, robust. Um, uh, work practices when it comes to maintaining cybersecurity for those assets, right? And 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 along with that is uh, it's not just uh, strong regulations and and, uh, and standards, but there's also auditing in place, and there's also a lot of training that goes on. So uh, thankfully, I can say that we're 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 a lot better positioned than than say Ukraine was you know back then uh, ukraine has uh, the, the ukraine has definitely strengthened their 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 cybersecurity tactics and that's why you see that they have not fallen victim to another attack in their power grid anyway uh and 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 that's because they 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 implemented a lot of the same work practices that we had here already and we're, which are still developing and improving now here it's a, it, it's a constant never-ending battle to 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 d- deal with a moving dynamic threat right one thing I do know is that every utility is, is, is right now at a heightened state of, a, of awareness and alert for any kind of cyber attack. We're being very careful with uh, it, not, not just the utilities, but also all of these supporting, supporting businesses like us, for example. Very hyper aware of any kind of phishing attack. And that's usually where they get in. It's usually a phishing attack. 
So, so that's... Oh, well, you have to be careful about that. So tell me about your, your support of the utilities. Was it uh, HSI? Um, yes. And um, um, you have industrial skills and industrial training skills. and, and uh, <laughs> compliance there. Tell me, tell me what you do and, and what the, um, you know, the effort would be to make yourself hardened against cyber attacks. Okay, no, that, that's uh, that's a great question, actually, and 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 um, let me give you a few examples. There there are a few companies, specifically a smaller uh, municipalities uh, or smaller co-ops, are the ones that tend to be a little bit more vulnerable. Those larger utilities, like the Duke Energies, the Next Eras, they're 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 pretty buttoned up, right? And 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 they've done a great job of uh, of uh, maintaining their cybersecurity and its standards. But those smaller munis and those co-ops are the ones that usually need help. As as a uh, as a as a contracting consultant, and uh, we provide a lot of advisory services when it comes to helping them, for example, comply with a lot of those NERC standards. Um, ultimately, you know, we, we don't do the IT work for them. We just kind of help guide them towards that direction. Then it's up to them to then go ahead and, and and apply those IT standards and meet that compliance. So that that's one example, right? Just in the IT realm, and the other one is also uh, preparing personnel, specifically uh, system operations personnel, the ones that operate the control rooms, just to be more aware and be better prepared to be able to, to identify a threat or even m manage or mitigate, you know, uh, uh, an attack that's already been, you know, launched or is already happening. So. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's different uh, than it was. I mean, I remember, uh, gee, it must be ten years ago. But the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum took a trip um, to the various um, unions uh, that were involved in uh, training their members to install solar. Okay? So they had all built um, these solar training facilities and, and hired people to teach the young journeymen um, how to install solar. And that was interesting because, you know, we saw, uh, I guess you would say it was the cutting edge of solar installation. But we're not talking about that now. We're, we're talking about uh, software. Um, we're mm -hmm. talking about more, much more sophisticated training and equipment right. and analyses. Um, and my question to you is, uh, who's available? You know, this is the, the time of the great resignation. This is the time right. of people leaving the jobs for reasons that are not exactly clear. This is where we're in, in a, um, you know, uh, what do you want to call it? We're in a, in a kind of a strange moment in terms of right. the jobs, the job market, the applicants for the jobs and so forth. And for that matter, for going to college and learning. So my question is, if, if I said to you, if I'm, if I'm Joe Biden and I call right. you up one day, and I said, Guillermo, I, I need your help. I want to train a generation of people that will harden our utilities, our energy si systems all over the country. And uh, I, want, I want to start right now. I want to finish it as soon as possible. I want to get all the recruits I can get. I want to take them to the institutions that can train them best. I want to expose them to the best teachers in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to teach them all kinds of sophisticated software and hardware issues. What would you say? Two different approaches, right? Uh, right now, and, and funny enough, my wife works for, for Florida International University. She's the executive director of development, right, for the foundation. And one of the things we're noticing is that there is definitely a, a gap in, uh, in that type of like, personnel in the workforce, that type of experience. The other issue is that uh, IT professionals in, in the cybersecurity side, they're, they're, they're not even finishing school. They're getting recruited right in the middle of the program. So the, the need is so dire that, that, that they're, they're offering them jobs before they even get to graduate. So that's one definite, uh, the, the pipeline of, of graduates is, is, is not at capacity. And we really need to recruit more people to do that kind of work. And, and what they're paying these kids, because you know, to me, they're kids. Uh, I'm an old guy now, right? Fifty, my fifty. So, but but these kids are. In don't feel bad. Ones. Don't feel bad. Wait till you get to be my <laughs> age, then you can feel bad. <laughs> that stuff already hurts. <laughs> but but, uh, but they are they are they're recruiting these kids and and they're giving these amazing starting salaries, right? So, and they, they haven't gotten their undergrad degree yet, and, but they're putting them to work. Um, they're even getting to the point where they're they're beginning some programs in high school, a vocational program in high school. And it's almost like a trade. Right, like they have, like, a, like 
say like a line worker, for example. So, so that's that's really one one place to address the gap. We have a lot of professionals, right? Information management system professionals that that, that do go to school, get their degrees, get their certifications. You know, those usually lead the major project efforts, but the ones that do a lot, the ones that do a lot of the hard work is, is where we're sorely short on. And and as far as the training opportunity there, the, you know, it's 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 quite big. Uh, not just for universities, but for other, for example, office like mine, and then even even community colleges can get in on that, all the way down to vocational programs in high schools. So, well, a lot of um, uh, what kind of pay are we talking about? Um, you know, used to be, uh, um, you know, you, you you graduated from a local high school here in Hawaii, and you got a job as a lineman, and that was the mm -hmm. kind of job you could get. It was it was a job that was coveted. Um, I don't right. think I don't think that really covers the, the basis right now. Um, we need more. We need somebody who is uh, really Akamai about about software, hardware, the like, and right. who is very creative, who can wear the black hat and the white hat and all the hats right. um, and go anywhere and sit there at three o'clock in the morning and figure it out. Uh, what's it worth? What kind of pay can I get? Well, I was hearing. I was hearing for professionals with a master's degree, they're well into the six figures, just starting salary. Mm -hmm. Well, about 125, 140, 160. And that's in, in Miami numbers, right? So it is an expensive place to live. Um, yeah. Some of the undergrads are starting off in uh, anywhere between 50s to, 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 to 90. Uh, I mean, and those numbers vary, right? depending on where they work and what their skill set is and what they're going to be doing. So funny enough, because this, this week I was looking at a, at a, a paid apprenticeship as a line worker for, for uh, my oldest stepson. And he wants to get into the uh, electric utility on the union side. And a paid internship right now is starts you off in the mid to high fifties. Wow. So, so you're working and that's in a local contracting company here in Florida. It's not even the utilities, a contractor for the utility. So, so, so any of these jobs in the utilities are definitely coveted and there's still a shortage. They're just being very selective on who they hire, right? But they're there, the jobs are there and the need is there. Now, the other thing is that over the past 10 years, my observation, the utility companies have merged and consolidated. Um, their executives are moved around more than they were before. It's very corporate and very avant-garde in many ways. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so if I get a job like this, um, I can expect to have m many options and many moves from one right. part of the country to another, from one company to another. I mean, you've been with several, um, you know, right. uh, electrical generating and uh, technical companies uh, over your career. And, uh, and I expect um, that would happen to these fellows and girls who are getting this high pay. Um, it's not a matter of sitting at home. No. Well, the, 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 the bizarre thing is that now they, they can actually sit at home and work for any company in the country. Um, uh, there may be requirements that force them to be somewhere physically because of the whole cybersecurity aspect that they have to be within those that six wall perimeter, right? What we should call it. And and those are some cases, but but the majority of these these jobs they're mostly remote, so they can really work from anywhere. Um, yeah. So so it's interesting how, how times have changed and how the challenges are changing, but how we're also meeting those challenges is is, is rather ra rather fascinating, right? Sounds like a great career. Now, up to this yeah. point, we've been talking about hardening the system from mm -hmm. cyber attack and all that, making it m more efficient, more, what's the word, inv um, invulnerable. But, um, you know, there's other things, too. There's other things, too, that strike me. I mean, for example, we're, it's the old story of uh, you can't rely on infrastructure that's older than you are. <laughs> <laughs> Have to keep on building, yeah. especially when we're talking about electrical generation and distribution. Yeah. Um, so, for example, um, it seems to me that there's a lot of um, opportunity, or should be, a lot of opportunity for engineering and design, uh, where a utility company comes to me and says, "Look, we we need to put a new a new facility in somewhere. We need to build out a new grid somewhere." Uh, we need to, you know, design and install some kind of distributed system, and we need right. you to come in here, use your skill, use your design training, design capacity in engineering, maybe architecture, 
um, in, you know, creative ways. And um, right. that, that's not necessarily dealing with hardening against cyber, cyber attack. That's just building out a system. Am I right? Well, that, right. Building out the system is the beginning, right? So usually with the design, the design part of the project, usually it, it's you have a certain number of engineers, right, that are involved in that. But for the, the one or two engineers, maybe three engineers that are involved in the designing that particular piece of, of, uh, of uh, that one asset, you're going to employ maybe 20, 30 field personnel for, for the duration of that project. So, so really the need is in the actual labor that, that does, does the work of installing all this equipment, doing from, from the construction portion of it to the commissioning. And then you have the job I used to have, right, which was uh, commissioning substations. And uh, figuring out all the all the relay protection settings, right? For and then testing it, and then uh, putting it in service, and troubleshooting it and maintaining it. That's still you know ongoing work. So so there, it, it's a whole body of people, a whole army of people that are that are employed to just use all this. Now, when they install these devices, these facilities, right? Even these uh, stations, they themselves have a cybersecurity perimeter, which has, for example, badge and credential access. So it's it it's it's very regulated and highly secure when I, from a cybersecurity and even a physical security access, especially these transmission substations, um, and that's really in the mainland. And in Hawaii, I I remember they had the same thing going on. I mean, uh, whenever when yeah, no, they do, they do. You you really have to have credentials. Uh, yeah. Let me go a step further though, Guillermo, and and that is. Um, you know, we were talking before the show began about how jobs and manufacturing and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. uh, is coming back because uh, China is outpricing itself and transportation is so expensive. And, and we still have a trade war, lest we forget that trade war that uh, that Donald Trump started is still going on. Those tariffs are still in place. And so we there's a tension, you know, uh, and it affects trade. It affects um, import, export. So uh, you were mentioning that there are companies that are being established, entrepreneurial activities in this country. There's R&D happening. Uh, there's the design and manufacture of new devices. Mm -hmm. And when you think of energy, uh, you maybe you don't think of it right away. You, th you think of a, a huge facility, but no, there's all kinds of little stuff too. Uh, high tech stuff that's only that big, little black boxes. Um, Inverters, for example, that's just one small right. example. Right. Um, and so it seems to me that there's a whole new uh, area of study, of training, of opportunity mm -hmm. for creative design, invention, manufacture of these high tech pieces of, of gear. Right. No? right. And uh, outfits like Schweitzer. Uh, Schweitzer Labs or GE, for example, they 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 manufacture most of the, the these uh this hardware uh, usually in the U.S. right, and, and there were uh, cybersecurity standards that looked into the whole uh, threat of, of actually having chipsets that would would already have malicious code or malicious access built into them. So so that that, that already was a concern, right? Which which was addressed. I mean I, I mean I'm sure there. Are, there's equipment out there that got through that were, was bought somewhere and, and now it's in service somewhere, right? But usually that may get caught during during one of the audits and it's removed, right? But uh, yeah, there's definitely opportunities here, especially as as a, a lot of a lot of um, better minds of mine suspect that uh, manufacturing and that sort of like even uh, from raw goods all the way down to distribution, it's gonna get more likely. You'll see more of that happening in the U.S. At least in Canada and the U.S. And, and well, the thing, the thing about yeah, I mean, if you put these two subjects together, there's a real benefit in doing it in the U.S. from a point of view of national security. I remember a, a 60 Minutes show a few years ago, where this utility, I think it was in the state of Texas, ordered some circuit boards from China, and they gave them specifications and all. And everybody knew what was requested and what was supposed to be manufactured, and the circuit boards arrived. And there was a little a little piggyback thing on the circuit board, mm -hmm. and the guy who ordered it said, "Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why why is this piggyback? We didn't order this little piggyback chip that we now see yeah. on the circuit board." And uh, you know, the problem is they could never figure out exactly what it was supposed to do. They only knew they didn't order it, so it could have been something really <laughs> tricky and dangerous. Yes. 
Um, so yeah, and, if we manufacture that in this in this country, we're not likely to have that experience. Right. Or, or we, we may have better control over that. Right. And, and, and that's really what we'll ultimately look at. And then it, it just used to be a function of cost. Right. It, uh, manufacturing overseas was just a function of cost. And, and now that, that that's that's becoming the, the, the difference between man, doing it there and doing it here is becoming smaller and smaller. So it's going to come to a point that it's no longer going to be worth it. And so you may see more of that, more of that built here. So, so that, that's really what drives it, right? I mean, but ultimately, I mean, we saw what happened during the whole, the beginnings of the pandemic, just by just getting masks, or right? it was almost impossible, getting materials, getting all these supplies. And we saw how hard that was, and, and none of it was made here. So a lot of companies sprung up and they began to manufacture their own stuff here, right? And, 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 Quickly, you know, they, they met the need, but as, as soon as they met the need, you know, uh, production in China p- picked up and then, you know, they were they were competing with China at some point and they, they held their own for a while, but uh, you can't compete with that kind of scale, I guess, in yeah. that regard. Well, we've got to learn to find those places in the market where we can compete and we've got to incentivize uh, kids, may I use that term, to compete. And when I say incentivize, I think the government has the power to incentivize. It has the power to encourage kids to study a particular subject, like energy, for example, or software. And it can do that with uh, scholarships and with all kinds of incentives. And that's what it needs to do. Yeah. You know, and and one thing we've been discussing, and 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 this is something that I've, has been bothering me for like the last decade, right? It's, it seems that a lot of the legislators that are legislating policies on energy, whether it's renewable or or not, it's it sometimes seems like they don't have the uh, comprehensive knowledge of what it is that they're doing. They don't have to know the details, but they at least need to know an, an overall picture. So, and maybe I'm naive when I say that, but it seems sometimes that they 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 haven't consulted with the engineers running the system, right? That to, to figure out how it actually works before they legislate some of these uh, some of these mandates, some of these laws, or some of these goals, right? So, so I think that, I, I think that applies. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, and and, and uh, they're. They, they've gotten better. Uh, they've gotten more educated, and they understand how the grid works. But but sometimes, you know, that, that's that's like a, as a reaction to to failed policies in, in most occasions, right? That's what I've seen. So, I really hope that changes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, we certainly have that in Hawaii. I mean, you, you can have people who are they're spread very thin over policy issues, mm-hmm. and they don't know the technology, and they don't know how to learn the technology, and yet they're responsible. Um, to implement, to to design and implement policy. And so uh, at the very least, they have to go out and find brain trusts that will help them. They have to be able to pick up the phone and get, you know, advice. In a more complex world, this is more of a a challenge, but it's also more of an obligation. You can't make policy without knowing what you're doing. Um, Absolutely. So the the other thing, the other thing I want to mention to you is, um, is troubleshooting. You know, mm-hmm. in our studio, in our, in our, uh, you know, broadcast experience, the most important thing is troubleshooting. What happens when something goes wrong? And in the case of energy and uh, generating equipment to distribution equipment, um, you really have to be quick and you have to know what went wrong and you have to maintain and you have to repair and you have to have a stock of spare parts, whatever it is, in order to prevent, uh, you know, a breakdown and a, and a brownout or a blackout and, and so forth. You have to be hardened against, uh, you know, uh, weather and natural disasters. And we can expect more bad weather with yeah. climate change. So um, that's a whole different area of training, isn't it? Troubleshooting actually requires more than some of the other areas we've been talking about. Well, I, I did quite a bit of troubleshooting when I was a field engineer, right? Uh, you you usually got called at two or three in the morning to go fix something. Uh, stations in the dark is because some 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 critter, poor critter, got up in the bus work and you know and and you had a fault and the thing blacked out, right? So so and then a lot of times I have to go out there and figure out what happened and, and with it, hopefully under an hour you, you restored. Now 
from a grid perspective and in a greater scale, a lot of the training that we do uh, involves the philosophy of uh, operating to an N minus one contingency. What is and what that? that usually means, that means basically you need to be able to withstand your most severe single contingency, meaning that the worst case scenario happens, you need to be ready to be able to like ride through that and, and, and operate seamlessly and, and be able to sustain that, that kind of impact. Um, and that's how the whole grid works, right? They, they have a system that actually runs a contingency analysis every five minutes. And what it does, it just takes an entire model of the system and it takes one element out at a time, runs a power flow, and then it sees what happens. Okay, what gets overloaded if I take this one out? And it does it to every element in their system. So it, pretty, pretty extensive computing, right, that, that goes on. And that's from a greater scale, right, when it comes to the grid. Uh, when you, now, of course, coming down to the scenario of the studio, right, I mean, one of the things, I, if, if I were an engineer, I would just have like backup systems, because a lot of times you may not be able to fix a problem quickly enough on the fly while you're broadcasting. So, so ha having a hot standby uh, backup system is usually the way I would do it. Uh, and that's kind of what we train a lot of as well, right? As, as many different philosophies, and but those philosophies are, are things that we train on quite a bit in the industry, and also as the companies that uh, support the industry. Yeah, and it gets it gets more complicated as we go forward because, yeah. you know, the the curve during the day, the demand curve during the day mm -hmm. can change. It doesn't have right. to be the same hours every day or week, well. and uh, you've well. got to be prepared. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah, we do, and. So, it, but but it is fascinating work, and and I could spend hours talking about this because I, I really enjoy it. <laughs> well, I want you to. Um, you know, uh, we we fashioned this as um, you know a, a training for uh, better energy, and yeah. I I hope you can do a, a regular series of shows and breaking everything I, we talked about down to component parts and make okay. it educational for these. May I say kids again? These kids yeah. who, who may want to study this and make big bucks and, and help the country remain, you know, uh, secure. Well, I, 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 I'm grateful and I certainly welcome the opportunity. And, 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 uh, and, and again, thank you for presenting, me, presenting us with that opportunity. So we happily do it. So. Well, you know, it's, um, I was going to say that uh, what we are talking about is national. It certainly goes beyond the shores of Hawaii. It's national. Um, but it's, it's more than that, too. It's, it's, it's global. I mean, for example, if I have a generating system, uh, some of them in this country are really old, and hopefully the infrastructure money will come and help those systems, you know. Um, but if I have a system that's really old, it might have been made in Germany, um, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, and, um, and we want to fit spare parts. Say again? No, it's like some of your units still run on diesel, bunker C oil and that sort of thing. So I see you have that. <laughs> so the question is if, uh, you know, the, uh, the SJ67 SJ ball bearing unit breaks, yeah. okay, where, where are you going to get a replacement uh, yeah, for something? <laughs> well, I see that done where they manufacture it on site and they had a whole machine shop at some of these older power plants before they finally got decommissioned, where they had it, their job was to just manufacture parts. Yeah. You know I mean? Well, it's, that's, 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 lot, <laughs> and that, that's useful. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, some uh, people point, who were, right? yeah, well, I mean, why not? I mean, it, in fact, it's, it's kind of encouraging to find that they have a shop that can do that. Uh, right, and right. why do I imagine that the, the people in that shop have had lots of experience in engineering in the service, in the military, uh, where right. they may and, have learned how to use that equipment. And, and one thing I had noticed, though, and, and some of these power plants, right, the, especially those older fossil fuel power plants, they, they um, not like the combined cycle plants, which are more modern, right? And, and we'll get into more of that in, in, in other segments. But they, they were usually just, uh, they weren't young young machinists. They, they tended to be up closer to retirement. So once once they're gone, it's you're going to be hard-pressed to find somebody that's going to replace them. So. That's another thing. So again, we're also sorely lacking in the trades. We really are, as well, as an industry and and also as as an overall workforce. We really are lacking in the trades, skilled labor. It strikes me that you have a whole generation. I mean, it's a, it may not be easy to rope them in, but a whole generation 
of these machinists, these engineers who understand, you know, the equipment, the materials, the design right. uh, of, of equipment that ranges over decades and decades. And um, if when they retire, they're a tremendous force Brain drain. because, you, yeah, well, you know, uh, Guillermo, you Brain can drain. call them, get, pick up the phone and say, look, uh, we're establishing a unit to train you mm -hmm. to train them. Uh, come on around and we'll give you an opportunity you never had before. <laughs> Some of them may want to do it, but others have done really well with the 401k and pensions and they'll be like, no, I'm done. And, 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 and I, I try to hire some of the retirees. <clears throat> And, and I'm telling you, like, more often than not, they're like, thank you, but no, I'm on a cruise. And, you know, and, and that's, you know, they work really hard to retire, and a lot of them just don't want to come back. So, no it's matter really, <laughs> it, it is a, ma a matter of national security, because as yeah. time goes by, uh, the, the war, if you will, between cyber attack and cyber attack will grow. The equipment will get older. The demand will get more, will, will increase and get more sophisticated. Um, the use of electrical energy in the country will increase in every way. Um, and it will be more and more difficult to figure out how to do it efficiently. Um, right. and, and, and that, that once again, this reinforces the, reinforces the, uh, the expectation of we need to have more investment in STEM fields, right? Science, science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and it's, 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 we've, we are possibly falling behind, right? And, and so we need to get re, re sharpen our focus on that particular aspect of uh, education. So. Yeah, and I, and I think it's really interesting that you could have a company um, centered anywhere or centered nowhere, you know, a distributed Zoom connection company of experts um, right. anywhere or nowhere in the country uh, that, that, that is trading on its expertise uh, and uh, they could service utilities and companies like HSI from anywhere in the country, or for that matter, the world. Anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah. The United anywhere States the could become the center for this worldwide. Oh, think? yeah. And, and especially now where, where there, there's, there's the bandwidth reach is, get, is getting everywhere, right? Uh, even in developing nations, you still get good bandwidth in most places. So, so the availability is to be able to deliver that training is there, much like you and I are doing right now, right? And true. even in the virtual space, I mean, eventually we'll get to the virtual space where, where it'll be a whole different world. It'll be like you're, you know, then think of it as telepresence and you're there viewing the, the facility, like if you're there. So one day yeah. we'll get there soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's true. I mean, we have a company that uh, has a show with us, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which does medicine that way. And you know, that yeah. was fits and starts for a long time, but now it's pretty much established. You can talk to a doctor anytime, and uh, mm -hmm. the doctor can say, "Let me see that. Show it to me. Show right. it to me." Right. Uh, the same thing, um, you know, with uh, m maybe the technology has to move a little, little more, but. Um, so he's, he's at a generator set and uh, somebody is looking at the generator set through his camera and mm -hmm. saying, okay, turn that wrench a little right. more to the right and maybe you'll have it. Right. Uh, right. Or put those wires together. Let me get a close up. Um, and so you can do maintenance and you can do the repair from anywhere to anywhere. Right. Uh, that, that's coming. Right. 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 There, there are certain tasks that, that you know, you're, you're going to have to have hands on and boots on the ground. But, but when it comes to the, the, um, the leadership and advisement, right, uh, you may have you may not need a person there at every site. You may have one person managing different sites remotely. Right. But and, and just a, following up with the labor that's there, the skilled labor that's there and the and the and the experts that are there. But the management doesn't really have to be there anymore. So, so they, you know, they, they can be, they can be um, deployed, you know, remotely for different places and, and have a greater scope without actually physically having to be there. So that definitely so changes. If we are talking and we are talking to young people or people, you know, who are finding their way right now in this very, mm -hmm. um, you know, what do you want to call it? Difficult market. This unsettled market is what it is. Right. Right. Um, what, what's your advice to them? Uh, where do you start? What foot do you put out first? Um, how do you get into this? Uh, what can you expect and, um, and why? Okay, so if they're looking at it from a cybersecurity IT perspective, right? Uh, it, 
it's try and get into that early, even as early as high school, right? Start, start, start working on that. Start nurturing that knowledge and interest in high school. Uh, college is still a good, viable, you know, route and option. I mean, it's it's getting a four-year degree in, in information management or computer science, and even specific training on cybersecurity is is available and it's there, right? Um, also, if on the trade side, uh, on the trade side, there's definitely opportunities, right, for associate of science degrees. All in the same, uh, also in the IBEW, SC Union side, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, which now includes sisters too. Uh, they, you know, that that is a definite avenue that they can also pursue because that also includes the cybersecurity aspect of it when it comes to physical security. And then ultimately, right, just something as simple as the vocational aspect, right? And 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 that ties into the first point I made about high school. I mean, it really, there is a vocational side to all this. Of course, that all depends on their individual schools in a school district, right? So they may have to work with either a magnet program or work with the administration in their schools to see if that type of program and funding is available, right? But the opportunities are there. Now, on, on a different side of this industry, there is a definite need for for the skilled labor on like the line workers the the technicians the electricians the the substation uh journeymen all of that is 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 there is a shortage and and but right now also competition again is fierce because of the fact that that they're they're trying to hire the best people and 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 they they often get really 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 um selective right with in that whole uh, interview process so that's something to keep in mind so just um uh, my advice to them was to be, be prepared for for that that sort of interview and that sort of uh work up towards so just get, getting that interview or or that apprenticeship really for the for the skilled labor side yeah and the unions have a role to play here you know where when i made my my trip with uh, the energy policy forum 10 15 years ago uh, they were really focused on the plumbing end and the electrician end of installing, mm-hmm. um, you know, solar and water heaters and that. But they can go much further and they can oh, train yeah. train these kids to do anything and they can encourage them. They can give them classes. They can give them remote classes, you know, yeah. courses yeah, online and, and all that. Yeah. And, and you don't need a computer science degree. To, to to understand how, how some of these systems work, right? And and uh, so so the opportunities are there, right? And they, they a lot of them don't require a four year degree, right? So so that that can easily be had as a as an AS degree, associate of science, or even vocational programs. So so that's all within reach, right? And, and there's different tiers of employment and and demands for labor. Uh, all over the place when it comes to this particular industry. So there are many opportunities and, and there's a place for everyone, you know, in that hierarchy of, of, mm. of management and labor. So. Okay, I hope you'll drill down on on these things one by one and get into the oh, substance yeah. of them and uh, and actually do a little training on the show, so to speak. You know? Sure, sure, yeah. sure. I would welcome that, yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to. Guillermo Sabatier, HSI. Uh, who is into uh, both training and compliance in the energy industry. Uh, I look forward to more with you, and I really appreciate you coming on the show, Guillermo. Well, thank you, and uh, I appreciate you inviting me and having me on the show. As they say, aloha. Aloha, and thank you again.